genre transformation that tangent bundle into a cotangent bundle. And the metric here on the tangent bundle, well, let's, let's call it the norm squared. And this thing uh, we will denote uh, by H, where H is the fundamental Hamiltonian. So, a Hamiltonian, all it is is a function. It's the fundamental Hamiltonian for, for, and I'll let me use a word that I may not have used so far geodesic flow. This is, uh, this is the first order over the E on the tangent bundle when you have the variables Q and Q point. So it's the first order of ODE and Q and Q point, and a system of ODEs. And of course, as you know, I hope, I will re-emphasize this a thousand times because it's so important to me. This is the same thing as a local one parameter group action. understands what it means a group action of the group R. The added group R. So G of X, uh, G S of X is the same thing as G T G S of X equals the same thing as G plus T 
and to the right. It is an action of the group R. Right? This is not an action of the group R because it's only, not necessarily, it's only local. You cannot integrate it all the way. Okay. Now remember from OBE, and you, I'm sure you learned this from Kayla and, uh, my friend Kayla. This thing uh, is globally integrable. So the uh, above the ODE, first order ODE, is globally integrable. That means this. If if the manifold, and let me even be a little bit more, the support of the, of the vector field, so the ODE defined by the vector field, so if the support of the vector field where X is the, the vector field under consideration, Fact, right? If if the support of the vector field is compact, then in fact you can globally integrate this thing. Okay. So what that means, for example, is that what you could do is you take x and you say I don't understand this thing, and I will cut it off by a cutoff function. Right? Which is one on any place I care about goes down to zero and has compact support. So this great myster 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 mysterious thing of local integrability is not mysterious if you're only worried about a certain compact region in your manifold. Right? Cut it off, it's globally integrable. It's an R action. It is nothing more than an R action. Action of the additive group R. Okay. So, this thing is a local one parameter group action. If you want to understand it on a compact manifold, you don't have to worry because you don't even have to cut it off. The manifold's compact. Yes, ma'am? Why would fail if the manifold was not compact? I don't know what manifold I have. Do you give me a manifold? I have a manifold. Well, say the support The manifold M that we're dealing with, with this vector field, the tangent bundle, in this case, the tangent bundle, what I'm saying here is completely general. But in this case, the tangent bundle, which is certainly not compact. Okay? Locally. Hmm? Where should we speak? Yes. Okay, you need some local sort of condition. Hmm? As long as it's locally compact or something. Ah, uh, it's a manifold. Right. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you're thinking of dynamical systems of some general type, maybe. Right? Mm -hmm. But I'm thinking of a manifold in a vector field. Okay? If the support of the vector field is not compact, then what happens? I don't know. Sometimes it's globally integrable, sometimes it's not. Yeah. Let me tell you what the nice theorem here is. And I will prove it, but it just relates to your question. If you have geodesic flow, which you may consider either on the tangent bundle with Lagrange equations, or on the cotangent bundle with the Hamilton equations, I prefer it, everybody prefers the Hamiltonian equations, much simpler to deal with, okay? If you have if that manifold, the manifold is complete. If M is complete, okay, I don't say anything about the tangent bundle or cotangent bundle, then, in fact, the geodesic flow is globally integral. But it means complete with respect to the metric that's defined by the the distance function of the Riemannian structure. Okay, so I will I, th that statement, which I will not repeat for you because it's boring for you. The ambient manifold is complete and not compact. For compact manifold, almost everything here I say is trivial. Okay, but for non-compact man manifold, it's not so not so trivial. 
And this theorem, this is a wonderful mathematician. So everything he he uh, he did is wonderful. He had a student uh, in Berlin before he went to uh, the Schweiz. Uh, a name like this, which you can see from the name, even that it's uh, Eastern German name. And this man stayed in Eastern Germany and ended up, uh, um, I think, in uh, Greifswald. It's a place, if you know, somehow, not so far from here, up in the northern part. So this form and complete. Okay. And complete means in the distance function defined by the metric, right? right? It means somehow when you go to the boundary along a geodesic, the length of the geodesic goes up. I mean, it's, it's something like that. It's completely obvious. If when you go to the, on, to the boundary by a geodesic, and the length of the geodesic is not blowing up, then you can't globally integrate this thing, because you have to go outside the manifold to integrate it, right? <laughs> right? So somehow it means you, if you go to the boundary by a geodesic, means you can go to the boundary uh, any way you want by geodesics, and the distance blows up as you go to the boundary. That's the intuitive meaning of completeness. And it means that the vector field is globally integral. Okay. So we're thinking about these are the Lagrangian equations. The Hamiltonian equations uh, are written, uh, the Hamiltonian field that I write in this notion, notation is uh, This field, it's a very, very wonderful field. <clears throat> that means the, the integral, the, the way you should think about this thing, we're in physics coordinates and we're somehow in a coordinate space of QP. <clears throat> and this is the local orbit, if you're lucky, global. And of course, you have a tangent vector along this orbit, which is the velocity. And the velocity is Q, we write it as Q point, P point, as you know. And this, this says the Q point is just the negative derivative of the Hamiltonian. And P point is the positive derivative. So the very simple ODE. Uh, a big advantage having gone to the cotangent bundle. There's a huge motivation for the cotangent bundle. Much simpler than that. So this was the original step in symplectic geometry. And I'm reviewing what I said yesterday. definition, some words. So M omega, now the structure is a, instead of being a metric, which is a symmetric thing, it's now an alternating thing. So is this thing is uh, symmetric, a uh, symplectic? Uh, means that omega is a two form, uh, which has set two conditions. It's closed, so D O to zero and non-degenerate. <clears throat> that if a manifold has such a form, then it's called a symplectic manifold. Yeah. And the motivating example gives us uh, in the tangent bundle so the cotangent bundle with the Legendre transform data along with, well, just the cotangent bundle with this standard symplectic form is our first example. <clears throat> and in local 
coordinates. The usual physics coordinates that I've been using, the ones above here, then the QP. It's very funny, it goes against my nature to call you say QP, I want to say PQ, I don't know why. A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J, K, L, M, N, O, P, Q. I want to say P first. <laughs> For some reason, you should say Q, P. You should learn to say Q, P. This is, of course, the coordinate of the base. Q. This is the coordinate chart of the base. This is the canonical coordinates of the fiber. And this is symmetric. Uh, the symplectic form in this, in this situation is just DQ, DP. Which is... Some dqi. These are functions, so I put the i up here. Uh, where dp i. <clears throat> okay. So at the beginning, we need to make some fundamental examples, which are very closely related to this. I'm repeating still. I got confused with my notation yesterday with omega and u. You pointed it out. So let's say v is a real vector space. comment that uh, finite dimensional manifolds are what I am talking about in this course. But Arnold's formulation, for example, of hydrodynamics is an infinite dimensional symplectic manifold. Very interesting. Uh, it's a very interesting formulation. Many, I was mentioning to somebody yesterday, there's something called the Cordova de Vries equation. It's a part partial differential equation, maybe you know it. It's for the motion of a wave of a wave in shallow water. If water gets deep and everything's all sorts of problems, it's a horribly complicated situation. In general, no matter whether it's complicated or not, it's nonlinear. So you have water waves, and as you know, you if you watch, which I do sometimes from my apartment in Florida, I watch the waves come in. Actually, I watched it more in my apartment on the Rhine River because you can really, it's, you know, turbulence in the ocean is not so good, but if you can watch it along a river, you can really watch waves. And the, what was observed by, by uh, well, this Dutch, these uh, Dutch people, I'm not sure who observed what, is that you have soliton, so it's extremely interesting, and, and we use soliton now for all sorts of things, and, and, communication theory and so on. But you have some sort of wave. So think of this beautiful Japanese picture of that guy. You know, you know this beautiful blue wave. You have this wave and you have all sorts of turbulence. <laughs> and this wave is moving and having fun and is very nice and gets into this turbulence. And the most amazing thing, it comes out the other side unchanged. It says there's some sort of invariance that are not being disturbed by this turbulence. And so people got very interested in that, including great mathematicians uh, in, the, in the old Soviet Union as well as at Kurant Institute in the United States, and <coughs> studied this very carefully. Um, uh, and Arnold then had the idea of an infinite dimensional model. This thing. It's an infinite dimensional symplectic manifold, and <laughs> you're interested in studying the symplectic geometry and these flows on this infinite dimensional manifold. Why not? And you're looking for constants of motion. You're looking for objects which do not change with the dynamical system. Right? You're looking for invariance of the dynamical system. Well, that's just an example of where infinite dimensional. Uh, 
chance if they could jump this rather than that, that one cover. It's just it's just so you know. So if uh, V is finite dimensional, so let's let's say V omega is finite dimensional. Vector space. <clears throat> this is the model, in some sense, uh, for uh, the, the model. This is a, the model for a little. This is equal to m omega locally. This is Darboux theorem. This is a big theorem. You understand? This is a very big theorem. Locally, there's nothing going on. Locally, a symplectic manifold by Darboux is a linear thing. It's a vector space with a linear vector space structure. So let me emphasize this. Omega is the bilinear form. Bilinear form alternating because it should be a two form, right? Alternating and non degenerate. So we might call this a linear symplectic structure. It's just it's, it's the same thing, it's non degenerate, it's automatic. It, if it's not a generator, it is, if it's bilinear, you see, it's automatically uh, uh, closed. So that's not, this is what a symplectic vector space is. And Darboux says everything is locally a symplectic vector space. So this is a fantastic result. Right? It's also an old result, it's very surprising. Uh, and as I said yesterday, uh, as you see the proof of Moser, I don't know in the old days whether Dragu really proved this or not. It's very hard to know what these people really proved, what well, Moser really proved this carefully. So it's bilinear alternate agent and non degenerate. And <clears throat> what, what we would like to do is to maybe, we have an idea. be wrong, but I write, I don't, I'll, you must start with wrong ideas to have uh, right ideas, right? is you try to diagonalize omega. Omega is a bilinear form. Everybody here knows that if you take a basis, you can write a matrix of omega down, right? Take some basis, you write down the matrix. This matrix, if you think about it, it's going to, it's going to be, yes, ma'am? Oh, but omega is a bilinear form only locally, right? Bilinear form what? Only locally or globally? Just, just locally. No, on a vector, I, I have a vector space. Forget, I, I, ah, okay. Darbu, you're right, you're right, you're right. It's, because of Darbu, it's really locally on the manifold. But I can just start with a vector space okay. if I want. And then it's going A lot of people in the business just start with vector spaces. And this is also very, there's some non-trivial stuff going on with representation theory at the vector space level. So, so it, it's not stupid. Okay. So I'm, I'm doing something I think is useful. I'm starting with the vector space. And I'm starting with the symplectic vector space. And I have some experience. I remember, I have some experience. If V, G, is, uh, say, a Riemannian vector space. So, the same thing, except Riemannian, that means a symmetric uh, positive definite bilinear form, or these guys in physics, guys and girls in this case, we have two different people here, these guys and girls in physics will tell you maybe not necessarily positive definite, right? You might have a light cone and all of this stuff. Then you can diagonalize. Uh, with uh, eigenvalues of the symmetric matrix on the diagonal. So after conjugation. Right. 
Maybe so many of them will be positive, maybe other ones will be negative, who knows, I don't care. Okay? Right. But you cannot diagonalize this guy. You cannot diagonalize this guy because the symplectic form applied to any vector is zero. Right. Because it's alternating. And remember, diagonalization means that if the matrix, uh, matrix of omega is equal to m, then what this means is omega equals omega of vw in its basic basis that we have been taking is v transpose mw, right? And for this, if this matrix is diagonal, that would mean that omega uh, uh, vv is is always uh, here something of an eigenvalue times the norm of v. That cannot be. Well, it can be. I'll give you one example. The zero alternating form. Right? That's it. So you can't do that. Okay? Okay, good. I started a proof yesterday, which was right at the start, but I forgot to finish, and I just pointed out I was being stupid. But let's finish the proof today, what I started yesterday, okay? So, nevertheless, we can come close. So please, when you're trying to do mathematics, start with an idea that may or may almost certainly is wrong. All right? Start with an idea which is almost certainly wrong and deform your idea, okay? So let's start with an idea which is certainly almost wrong, I just did it. Same thing, same thing I did yesterday which is almost certainly wrong, let's take a line. What's the diagonalization process for, for a symmetric structure? You take, you take an eigenspace, yeah? And then you look at the orthogonal complement of that eigenspace and you go on and you diagonalize the thing by induction, right? Isn't that the proof? So let's do the same thing. Let's, yeah, why not? It's, it's an idea. And so we look at the perpendicular uh, orthogonal complement of this line with respect, with respect to the form. This is what I did yesterday, but I forgot to complete the proof. Right? Ivan points out that the problem with this thing is the picture, the picture that you're going to draw here which my grandson probably will draw, is that the orthogonal complement is perpendicular to this thing that looks like this. Right? But the point is here, the orthogonal complement contains the line. It's, yes, I just wrote it on the board a hundred times. Omega of VV is equal to zero. So if the orthogonal, then this picture is wrong. So this picture, we have to correct the picture. The orthogonal complement contains the line. Right? So I love to draw pictures. So here's the line, and here's the orthogonal complement. Here's the line, and here's the orthogonal complement of the line. Okay? Now what you notice is the orthogonal complement of a one-dimensional space in an n-dimensional manifold of uh, vector space is n minus one dimensions, right? So this guy is one co-dimensional. Never think in dimension. Always think in co-dimension. I'm living in high-dimensional geometry all my life, and I'm always thinking in co-dimension. Okay, co-dimensional one is easy. What? What's the difference between dimension and co-dimension? Is it the dimension of the? Co there is no difference given given co-dimension. Uh, K, uh, in an n-dimensional thing, uh, the dimension is n minus K, right? I'm telling you, however, if you want to understand something, uh, if you want to understand a curve in three space, okay, that is co-dimension two, right? The fact that that curve is one-dimensional is useless. The fact that it's co-dimension two is extremely useful, okay? So you can see these planes, these planes, these normal planes as you're pushing the thing around. 
You see, I'm talking about what is in my brain, not as what on paper. As you're pointing out to me, I'm stupid, of course. You're saying you're stupid because these two numbers are the same, effectively, k and n minus k, right? Yeah, but sometimes the quality of two numbers is, you know. Okay, so what, what happens here, if this thing is one co-dimension, there's something in the complement, right? One, one dimension in the complement. Isn't that right? So let's call this, let's now change our notation. Let's call this L1, let's call this L1, and let's call this thing L2. Okay? And let's call this, this vector here uh, E1. Oh, this is now L1. And uh, let's call this vector here, I'm, I'm not going to call it E2, I'm going to call this F1 in the first pair. Okay? Now what about omega of E1, uh, of E1, F1? It's not zero, right? It's not zero. Do you agree I can scale things here so this number is one? I don't know, it's going to be 17 or something, or minus 85, but I can divide it. Yes? So by the problem complement, you mean with respect to the symmetric? Yes. So then it would be zero, why not? E1, F1. F1 is the complement. In the complement of the orthogonal complement. Yeah. In the complement of the orthogonal complement. This is the key issue here, man. It's not zero. I take, let's, let's yeah. repeat this. No, 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 this is a serious matter. You've got to get used to this if you're dealing with the subject. Yes. You start with something, you take its orthogonal complement, it's co-dimension one, and then in the complement of that orthogonal complement, I have one degree of freedom. That's why I say think in co-dimension. I have one degree of freedom, I take something. I don't care. It's something. I call the basis F1, and I can scale it so that this number is one. Okay? Look, what is the matrix of omega in that basis? The matrix of omega in that basis, you see, you relearn something by doing a stupid calculation. 1 minus 1, 0. Do you agree? Yeah, remember what it is, right? Of course, this says, this zero here says that omega applied to E1, E1 is zero. This one here says omega applied to F1 is one. This minus one here says the other way around. F1 applied to E1 the other way around is minus one, and this is zero. This is a famous matrix. Yes. I like to call this matrix J. Okay. This matrix J is rotation by 90 degrees in the usual metric. There's something really interesting going on here. Okay. So I let P1, and now I can have fun. Let P1 be the plane, call it P for plane. It's a two-dimensional plane, so we call it a plane. P1 is L1, what was that thing, plus L2. Right? You know, if, you're, if you should adjust your notation as you go along, because this is bad notation, I'm going to adjust it. Let's make this L1 hat, and let's make this L1 hat here, because, because obviously I'm generating a plane P1 with two vectors at L1 and L hat. Yeah, why not? Let's get the notation right as you go on. Right? So that's L1, L1 hat. That's the plane. And, and, and here, this, this, this thing restricted to P1 is given by the matrix J. Right. Okay. Now, the orthogonal complement of, with respect to the symplectic form always. When I say that, I mean, okay, it's bad notation. It's, it's not better. The orthogonal complement of P1 is really complementary to P1 because omega on P1 is non-degenerate. You get it? Omega on P1 is non-degenerate. Look at it. There's nothing that's orthogonal to everything in P1. Right? 
You want me to test it? Test it? If something is orthogonal to everything, I could put it in the matrix and see what happens. And nothing will. You understand? Right? There's nothing that's orthogonal to everything. So omega restricted to P1 is non degenerate. So the orthogonal complement of with respect to P1 and P1 are intersecting at zero, and they span the whole space. Okay. And I'm done by induction. I'm done understanding everything by induction, because that means that P is equal to P1 plus P2 plus So we have decomposed V highly non-canonically. Right? There are a huge number of choices here in a direct sum of symplectic planes. Not so bad. Yeah. And so the matrix here is J1, the matrix here is J2, the matrix here is Jn, and then of course the matrix of the full thing is the direct sum of those matrices. Here. Is there equal to J2? You're so quiet, I can't hear you. Aren't they J1, J2 equal? Because this is the same matrix, but a different space. The restriction of omega to P1 gives you a matrix J1 on this two-dimensional space. The form of the matrix is the same, right? Hmm? The form of the matrix is the same. It's the same matrix, yeah. but it's a totally different space. That's the reason, by the way, that we don't like to have matrices, but I just wanted to point out to you that it's the same matrix on, on, on another space. Okay? Okay? So the full matrix J of this form is, uh, it looks like this. J1, J2, Jn. In particular, we see that the space is even dimensional. And we have diagonalized the symplectic thing as best we could, right? We have decomposed the space into what we call hyper hyperbolic planes. Okay, this is the this is the best we can do in linear geometry, but it's not bad, right? Yeah. For physics people, this is will re be related to. The, the, to have n independent harmonic oscillators which are not affecting each other and using standard symplectic form of spectral space. Okay. Every physicist understands this, at least in another language. Okay. A nice remark. I like this remark about finite dimensional symplectic geometry. And then yesterday, I'm still reviewing, so I guess it's okay. Don't object, because yesterday was small. Yesterday, the main, the main new topic, the main thing that I want to re-emphasize today is the first key step is the so-called basic exact sequence of symplectic geometry, well, Hamiltonian mechanics. Since not all of you are studying mathematics, uh, but I hope you have the sense that algebra is important for certain things. And one, one important formalism from algebra, not it doesn't have much content, but one important formula is an exact the notion of ex exactness. And 
it, it can be written with arrows. So you have th three mappings, and if you're friends in mathematics, call them morphisms. That means they are thinking about these mappings res respecting the algebraic structure at hand. So if these are groups, these are uh, group homomorphisms. If these are vector spaces, these are linear. If these are modules, these are module homomorphisms and whatever. Okay, it's just uh, they respect whatever algebraic structure you've got. Okay? So these are more uh, alpha and beta are, are morphisms. And there, there is uh, there, there are two concepts. You say that this is a complex at D. So I'm looking always at B. Look always at B when you have three things. A complex at B means the image of alpha is contained in the kernel of beta. Okay. And that means that beta composed with alpha is the zero map. Yeah, that's what it means, complex. And this thing is called exact. It means that the image of alpha is equal to the kernel of beta. Now, algebraists Algebraists, but the, the form, people who formalize this stuff are not stupid. If you're trying to describe a set, how in the devil do you describe a set? You describe it by equations, right? You said something lies in a, in a set if all these equations are satisfied. Isn't that the way we define any, any set, really? You know, sets are defined by equations. And I hope you realize that this statement is a statement that the equations defined by beta define, give you the kernel, the image of alpha. You got it? The equations, the equations defined by beta, beta is a morphism, right? The kernel is where it's all zero. The equations given to you by beta are, yeah, kernel, tell you what the image of alpha is. So that's a wonderful situation that you can really, that you can really, and it's an exact description of the image of, of alpha by the equations, which I call kernel of beta. That's a wonderful situation. This thing, so the, what is called a complex here, is the image of alpha contained in the kernel of beta. It says the following, to be in the image, to be in the image, I should make it as, I should say this in Latin, but my Latin is not very good, to be in the image, So uh, an element must be uh, annihilated by the equations of A in the kernel of A. I'm just reformulating that, but it says that the equations of this kernel really give you a, a big restrictions on what is going to be on in the image. Okay. And now the difference you need to know, sometimes you know this, uh, if you have a situation here, you go to the cohomology, which says what you ought to look at if you have a complex is the kernel of beta modulo the image of L. Right? Because it says simply, look, you know you're in the kernel of beta, all these equations are satisfied, but you don't know if you, if you have all of the equations. <laughs> you may have something, it may be much smaller. 
maybe too small. Okay. So this is the cohomology of this. It's not some abstract nonsense. It is the beginning of a certain viewpoint in mathematics. It's not even the beginning of topology. It's the beginning of a viewpoint in mathematics and should be in physics. And you have it in physics. You, you certainly know. All these equations are satisfied, I know, but are there any other questions? Right? All these equations are satisfied, I know, but are there any other equations? So you write down this quotient. You understand what I'm saying? This, is this modulo equivalent to it. Right? It's not abstract nonsense. It's the right thing to look at, right? So what we use in uh, geometry, the first thing in geometry was introduced by Durham at the beginning of algebraic topology. He was a geometer. Uh, is Durham cohomology. Later, the singular uh, cohomology and, and, and all of this other theory was slightly later. Durham uh, in Lausanne and the Swaya in Switzerland. Other people, Alexandrov in, in Russia, in the Soviet Union, and Whitehead, and so on. They, uh, they introduced other things, but Durham introduced this, this thing. He said, Duram said, well, what's the, the case Duram cohomology of the manifold is the same thing. It's the, it's the cohomology of an obvious complex. It's the kernel of D. And now my notation for, what, for K forms is EK. This is more or less a standard notation, EK plus 1. These are K forms. I won't write it. Modulo the kernel. Modulo, modulo the image. What you look at this is the same thing. It's the same thing. It's exactly the same thing. Don't block because it's the word cohomology or think it's fancy mathematics. And don't reject it. I, many of my physics friends reject this, but they do it every day. They just don't know the language. Yeah. So what does this mean? We have a complex. I always write it as D. In fact, we have a huge complex. We have not only map K, K plus 1, K plus 2, K plus 3, and so on. This is a huge, huge complex. It's a complex because D composed of D is zero. You know that, right? The image of D is contained in the kernel of D. If you get mad at me, this is DK minus one, and this is DK, but I, uh, you know, it's a question where everything is defined, right? D composed of D is zero, right? That means that the image of this mapping is in the kernel of this mapping, that it means for, it is necessary for something in the image uh, to, to be annihilated by this operator if it's going to be in the image. So a necessary condition for being in the image is to be in the kernel. So you mod out by this. This is a cohomology. This is what you want to understand. Okay? Okay. That is the first step in after Riemann, in some sense, in the subject of algebraic topology. This looks analytic, and it is, because you see, these are, these are huge differential equations here. You're, I mean, if you write this in, in coordinates, you will see what it means, right? You have some big form, you take D of it, you have all these partial derivatives. <laughs> There's a big system of differential equations. This looks like analysis. And therefore, people tend to avoid it who are in algebraically oriented subjects. But it is what is going on, and almost always, this thing is isomorphic to the singular cohomology. Doesn't matter. I, I think I'm not even sure I know an example. I mean, if you start having pathology with singularities, then you will have problems with operators. You, you need the smoothness of the manifolds. Okay. And now, the basic exact sequence.
Crystal, these remarks are devoted to you because I know you haven't had as much experience as an object has had with, maybe you have a little experience with this algebraic stuff like this. Yeah, we did this in algebraic topology. Hmm? We did this in algebraic Did you do Durham cohomology? No. You did, you did the... Yeah, chain complexes. You did chain complex, which is the other way around from a homology, or you probably had the dual complex with... Same. But these complexes appear everywhere. You should just think, uh, by the way, I have a, a, a good friend in, in, you know, the French love uh, abstract mathematics, are very good at it. And one of my best friends in France was asked one time, what is mathematics? He was, he was asked in public, like on a television program, what, uh, sir, professor, what is mathematics? And, he, and you know, I, I wish I could do a French accent, I'm not very, well, you know, the, like so much like this. Well, uh, like, uh, French, uh, yes, uh, mathematics et cohomology. Mathematics et cohomology. <laughs> Pope. <laughs> <laughs> mathematics is cohomology. And in some sense, it's true. Yeah? You want to solve equations, the necessary equations, uh, conditions to be satisfied. Yeah? The obstruction to solving the equation is necessary modulo sum. Yeah? Phase exact sequence, watch it. Here we go. This is the canonical injection. The manifold is connected from, from um, constant functions into all functions. Okay? And this is the zero map. So the zero map goes to the zero function. And the kernel of this thing is nothing. So this sequence is exact. Here, the kernel of the injection is only the zero. That's the only thing that goes to zero. So this is exact. Okay? Good. Now, we go on. This is the thing I talked about yesterday, which I call H for Hamilton. Okay? This is the Hamilton map. Well, I'm going to map it into some place a priori. I'm, we don't know, but I'm going to map it into what I found out yesterday into the local... The Hamiltonian uh, field, what I call ham loc. What is the mapping? Let's review it from, from yesterday. H, from my, in my notation of yesterday, of a function is the associated Hamiltonian field of the function, which is defined by df equals omega x at point. Again, omega is a two-form, it is non-degenerate. So if you put something in the first argument, you get a one-form. And that mapping from the first from, from, from this first argument gives you a one-form, and from a one-form it gives you the first It's an isomorphism. Right? It's an isomorphism because omega is non-degenerate. Okay? This is called the Hamiltonian field of that because we checked yesterday that the Lie derivative of this thing, of the form, is zero. We checked that yesterday. And the way we check all things in this subject is with the Cartan magical formula. All things at the beginning here are magic from the Cartan magical formula and can be checked by a high school student if, if you agree that that formula is true. You just put in information. So you check this by Cartan. This is A.E. Cartan. And this A.E. Cartan formula is the lead derivative, is the anti-commutator uh, of co contraction and D. Okay. Now, that's where the algebra stops. And now we think. We look at this equation, this thing here. Okay? Yes? Isn't omega defined on the manifold? Huh? Omega is defined on the manifold, right? It's a symplectic yeah. manifold, yes. Yeah. Um, so if you say, well, omega is on a vector field and the other one is a variable, how hot to. I don't know how. Okay, let's start again. 
Omega is a two form. Yes. Omega, omega applied to two vector fields. You put these two vector fields in there. You get a number. You get a function, right? Yes, I'm, I'm, just, I'm just stating trivialities, and you must stop me when it's no longer trivial. Okay? If you put it in only one, one number, like I did in the front there, this two form is begging you. It gets down on its knees and says, "Give me another number." Yes. All right? So that means I've got a function. I've got a functional. I've got a. All right? Yes, but omega is defined on a manifold, so shouldn't you give it values in the manifold? So how can you fit the vector field? It's bilinear form, it's not on it's not a function of the manifold. So it's not defined on the manifold a priori, right? No, it's, it's a bilinear form. In this case, yeah, omega, we have a symplectic manifold, manifold omega. So you, you can feed into omega values that are not in the manifold. You can feed everything into it. At every point in manifold you get a bilinear form. At every point in the manifold, that's, that's what has not been yeah. said here. So No, no. Let, let. I think, um, I think that, uh, so it's not defined on the manifold. Um, that it takes vectors from okay. the tangent. Um, yeah. it's, it's, the tangent. It's, it's a two form on the manifold, but it's, it, 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 you apply it to vector fields. You apply it to pairs of vector fields. That's the definition of a two form. And if I apply it to only one and leave the other one empty, I get a one form. And if the two form is non degenerate, that gives me an isomorphism because, yeah? Right? Okay, so that's this miracle together with the, this is the miracle of the formula of Cartan, that together with this formalism that I confused you by because I didn't explain it well enough, but I think now you're okay, right? Maria? Yeah? Okay. We, we end up by saying that the Lie derivative of this thing is zero, which is a wonderful thing. It means that omega is preserved by the one, local one parameter group action of this field. Got it? The lead derivative is, is what is the lead derivative? Let's re remind you of what a lead derivative of this thing is. The lead derivative of, of anything, say y, of this thing is you pull back the thing by the one parameter group take the inverse to make, it, to make it a left action, and differentiate this thing at zero. You, you pull back the form, right? You're, in other words, you're pushing the form around by everything you can do to push it around. To make it a left action, you, it's really pulled back by the inverse, right? And you differentiate it, and it's, this differential is identically zero. It says that Omega is invariant by that. Right? Have you got that? Omega is invariant by that. You physics people, I know this from my friends in physics, say area is invariant. Let me say it again. Area is invariant. Okay? Area is invariant. Why do the physics guys say area is invariant? They will even draw you a picture. Maybe if you look at Arnold, who is wonderful, he will say, well, you have the geodesic flow, or, in this case, or any flow of this symplectic thing, and area is invariant. So we're going to draw a little parallelograms here. <laughs> you will see them drawing little parallelograms. And maybe the shape of the parallelogram will change, but the area does not. Because the lead derivative of the measurer of area, omega is a measure of area, right? The standard representation of a symplectic form on two-dimensional space is determinant, right? It is determinant, and determinant is area. I hope you know that, right? So one, we already have a deep observation that if you have geodesic flow, or if you have any Hamiltonian flow whatsoever, that area is an invariant of the flow. That is already very good. Right? Area is invariant. So let me write it here. In 
equal to whatever area needs, area is invariant. Now, why do we care about invariance? I'll tell you why. I wanted to give you an example of why I care. I think you could convince yourself that invariants are important. This afternoon, I will begin giving you the first examples of the subject. And I will begin explaining how one thinks about these examples and what is the obstruction to cultural development in all of the world including not, not just mathematics. Okay. Let me say it again. I think I said what I wanted to say. I will show you something this afternoon. I will show you what something um, now, almost, which tells us something. And I'll let you judge what it tells us. Don't believe my propaganda. tell you in a minute, maybe not this morning, but this afternoon, what is curvature? Very important in the subject, what is curvature? These are the three, of the stupid identifications, these are the three two-dimensional manifolds which are simply connected and of constant curvature, if you norm the curvature as being something. Like curvature zero in the middle, Curvature minus one on the disk and curvature plus one here. Whatever that means. These are curvature scalings. Okay. So here in our discussion, curvature with respect to the metric or the uh, uh, symplectic form? <clears throat> curvature will be done, defined with respect to the metric. I will also explain this afternoon 
that they're in the complex situation which we have here, which I will claim is the most important situation for us, there is a very close connection between the symplectic form and a metric. However, the curvature notions will be with respect to the metric. Okay. okay. So these are the basic things that you want to understand. These are the these these three things. And so what I will show you this afternoon is that the metric on the sphere. I will explain it to you using my point of view of what is called Calarian geometry. The metric on the sphere is this in any one of your, fa in your favorite coordinate chart. <clears throat> the, uh, the, uh, this is the symplectic form. This is the symplectic form. And this gives you a, this gives you the metric. This is very in this case, and I will show you that this is essentially the same as the metric. Okay. Let me tell you what the metric is here. It is this. It can't be better. Uh -huh. It can't be any better. Why do I say it can't be any better? If I put if I put this here, what is that metric? That's the standard metric on the on the on the plane, right? Without this denominator. This denominator comes in here. Oh, I, I'm sorry. Uh, uh, this denominator is, is this. That's a square. Better than that. There is nothing simpler than that, except the stupid thing. Okay. Now let us suppose you want to compute the geodesics. We're working in two dimensions, yeah. What is that? Huh? Z. Z is a complex number. X plus IY. It's all constant. It's not coordinate. It's a coordinate. It's a coordinate. It's a coordinate on the complex plane. It's the standard linear coordinate. So then why don't we have NG? Why don't we have DZ? It would be degenerate. This is a what this is a this is a two form? Yes. This number here makes this two form something uh, real. X plus R Y, but just compute it out. Okay. okay. But it's better to think of it as Z. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Yes. Then why do we keep the X and the Y from G? Can we just do with the Z and the Z bar? Why do we? Why? Why, why do we have the Z notation? Why do we have the X and Y? So we use the Z notation and say that it's better. So why don't we keep yeah. using the Z notation for G as well? Um, I'm not sure what she's asking. Huh? So well, when you write g equals dx squared plus dy squared divided by 1 plus whatever, right? Okay. Um, if the z notation is better, why do you not use z there in the... Okay, but this tensor I, would, I wanted to write in this way because everybody knows that as the standard metric on, on R2. Okay, if you, if, uh, to make you happy, I'm... Uh, okay, it's just... It's also where my brain is. I mean, I, I, I think of this in complex geometry. But, okay? But you must admit, I, I am forced, by the way, I am forced to have, this is the best metric, this is the constant curvature metric, and I will, I will produce it for you this afternoon. This is the best metric you can have. This is the metric on the sphere embedded in R3. That's the wrong place to think about it, but uh, you can embed it in R3. So, what I wanted to do is, my desire sitting at my desk looking at the Rhine on a beautiful day with the boats going by and thinking this is a trivial thing for these students, I need to do something trivial for them. Uh, <laughs> yeah, at the beginning. What I wanted to do is compute the geodesic. Everybody knows the answer to that. We have been propagandized by our teachers in high school, right? They are the great circles. 
What is a great circle? Well, you can define it by intersecting with a plane. Yeah. Of a certain nature. Not all planes, but certain planes. What would, if you didn't know about this metric, if you didn't know the answer to that, I don't think you would figure that out very quickly. If I give you this thing, either in Lagrangian or Hamiltonian form, on the tangent bundle of the two sphere, which by the way, as you all know, is not trivial, right? The tangent bundle of the two sphere is a non-trivial vector bundle. I give you whatever it is, uh, say on the cotangent bundle, uh, so the, okay, so the, the differential, the symplectic structures, dq, dp, and so on. I give you the Hamiltonian, it's the norm function on the, and so on and so forth. And then you're supposed to look at the uh, equations and write down the geodesics. You will not be able to do it, I guarantee you. Now maybe you will, these physics people maybe, but no mathematician can do it. Because you have to compute well. You have to know how to compute. So just for fun, I'll leave you with this, I have to quit now. I looked on the web for Mickey Mouse mathematics. And of course when you're looking at, for Mickey Mouse mathematics, what you should do is you should go to the Khan Academy. No, 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 my grandson goes to the Khan Academy. It's very nice. I mean, there's certain things that he learns. And of course, now the Khan Academy has geodesics on the two-sphere. The Khan Academy has geodesics on the two-sphere. It's incredible. Oh, with this metric. So since I'm a not a physicist and I start the calculations, I, I, I hate the calculations. And, they, and I have to use all sorts of integrals and all sorts of sine, cosine, and hyperbolic sine, and all these identities and all this stuff. And I am not going to use the fact that I know that you intersect with a plane. How do you know that that's the right embedding? Where did you get that embedding? Yes? Suppose I give you this thing. I dare you. Suppose I give you this metric. You, even you as a physicist, I dare you, challenge you, not dare you, I challenge you to find an embedding of the two-sphere in R3, which gives this metric as the restricted metric for R3. Yes? You think you can do it? I will tell you, there's a famous theorem. It's called the Nash embedding theorem. It says you can do it, by the way, not in R3, in I5. Yes? Now, in this special case, you will probably make some projections and get it down into R3. But then it's awfully indirect because Nash has to solve some horrible partial differential equation. It's highly non-trivial. You will not be able, even you will not be able to do it. And for sure, I know. I know. Okay? You look at that Khan Academy thing. It's a 10 minute and 23 second video. <laughs> right? And you have all these integrals and all these sine and cosine and all these identities and so on. Where in the devil does that come from? And what is the answer worth? It is some expression, in, some exact expression in terms of functions that you think you understand. Yes? Prove to me you really understand the hyperbolic sine or something like this. You didn't you don't understand. It's some worthless, exact expression. It is some worthless, exact expression. The fact that you can compute this way by some horrible integrals is a worthless, exact expression. It will destroy mathematics if we insist on such mathematics. It will destroy mathematics if we insist on such mathematics. Okay? And it will destroy physics. Yes. Physics is, worse, is much worse off than mathematics because you physics people many times are looking for exact expressions. There is nothing exact. Let me remind you, there is no such thing as the two-sphere. The two-sphere does not exist in the world. Excuse me, why? The two-sphere has this thing, x squared plus y squared plus z squared equals 1 or something like this, right? You believe that exists in the world? No. Right? An exact expression is not worth anything. Okay? What is worth something is invariance. 
Yes. Invariance of the flow. If you know something like area is invariant, that's good. If you know a certain function is invariant, that's good. Right? That tells you something qualitatively about the flow. Okay? Keep that in mind. Exact answers are worthless in mathematics. Yeah. We think they are worthwhile because we are doing them on computing. We're putting into some computer and getting an exact answer with some algorithm. Right? But th that's nice because some numerical analyst tells us, put that in the computer with this exact algorithm, right? But the numerical analysis has already done an approximative thing. Right? There's no such thing as exact answers. Forget it. Okay? But I will show you this afternoon other ways of thinking about this. Okay? And look at the Khan Academy. It's, it's really funny. 10 minutes and 23 seconds. <laughs> Thanks. See you this afternoon.